So hello everyone and thank you for joining. Uh, we're just setting up and attendees are filtering in now. We should be ready to start in a couple of minutes. Bonjour à tous et merci de vous joindre à nous, de nous installer et devrions être prêts à démarrer dans quelques minutes. So welcome everyone, and thank you for joining to be in sync or out of sync, considerations for switching from LibQual to the InSync survey. I'm Julie Moray from the Carl office, uh, and I'm gonna run through a few housekeeping items before we start. So participants have been muted upon entry. You may use the chat feature to bring technical difficulties to our attention or to share resources and comments. Our presenters will also be taking questions at the end. So you're encouraged to type your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Questions can be asked in French or English and can be translated by Carl staff if necessary. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available after the session. Slides have been posted in French and English on the Carl website. Links to these and the Carl Code of Conduct have been included at the beginning of the chat thread for your convenience. Bienvenue à tous et merci de vous joindre à Choisir InSync ou non, réflexion sur le passage de LibQual au sondage InSync. Je suis Julie Morin du bureau de la BRC et je vais passer en revue quelques éléments de régie interne avant de commencer. Les micros des participants sont désactivés. Vous pouvez utiliser la boîte de discussion pour porter des difficultés techniques à notre attention ou pour partager des commentaires et des ressources. Nos présentatrices répondront également aux questions à la fin. Vous êtes donc encouragé à taper vos questions en utilisant la fonction « questions et réponses » au bas de votre écran. Les questions peuvent être posées en français ou en anglais et peuvent être traduites par le personnel de la BRC si nécessaire. Enfin, ce webinaire est en cours d'enregistrement et serait disponible après la session. Les diapositives ont été publiées en français et en anglais sur le site web. Des liens vers ceci et le code de conduite de la BRC ont été inclus au début du fil de discussion. Without further ado, I invite Sharon Murphy, Associate University Librarian at the University of Alberta and member of Carl's Continuing Education Working Group, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Uh, we're really pleased to bring uh, this webinar to you today. It feels very timely as we have switched up into new ways of working um, that we're very sensitive to what the needs of our users are. And of course, we always need to be evaluating how well uh, we are performing in meeting their needs. Uh, we do this using a whole variety of methods from anthropological to focus groups and, and we have a variety of tools that we use to support this. And amongst those are survey tools. When constructed, executed, and analyzed well, they gave us very important um, data that, that we rely on. Recently, both Dalhousie University and Carleton University libraries uh, chose to use InSync for this purpose. And to share their experiences, I am pleased to introduce our two speakers today. Linda Bedwell is the coordinator of assessment at Dalhousie University Libraries. She describes herself as hooked on library assessment and has led a number of library assessment projects and using a variety of assessment methods. Uh, Linda was also the coordinator for LibQual Canada in 2013. Laura Newton Miller is the head collections and assessment at Carleton University Library. She describes herself as an enthusiastic advocate for evidence-based library and information practice. She has applied this to assessments of collections, space, services, and planning. And her recent research includes work on strategic planning in academic libraries. Welcome, Linda and Laura. Okay, thank you, Sharon. This is Linda Bedwell from Dalhousie University. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, before I get started, I just want to mention that um, both Laura and I, uh, when we were asked to deliver this webinar, um, we had no idea that it would be on a day like today under these circumstances. Um, we are both Nova Scotian, and um, we just ask that you please be patient with us and be patient with yourselves, as uh, there are definitely some heavy hearts and heavy heads today. So I'll get started. 
Back in late 2018, early 2019, Laura and I led the deployment of the InSync survey at our, at our institutions. We are here to speak to that experience and to reflect on LibQual. So now, speaking of reflecting on LibQual, let's have a look back at LibQual Canada. So some or all of you may remember that the LibQual Canada Consortium was a place where a bunch of us um, within the academic libraries conducted the LibQual survey at the same time. So it may not have been exactly the same time, but at least within the same year. The LibQual Canada Consortium formed in 2007, and together we conducted the survey in three years, uh, three years apart. So those survey years were 2007, 2010, and 2013. So we started off in 2007 with 54 institutions participating. And in 2010, that dropped down a little bit to 47 institutions. And then in 2013, the year that uh, I coordinated for the consortium, uh, we had a mix of 47 institutions. So we kept the number, but it was a slightly different mix. Between 2007 and 2013, the total number of student respondents for the survey for all of the consortium uh, nearly doubled from roughly 20,000 in 2007 to 39,000 in 2013. Now, when I was wrapping things up in 2013, I surveyed the participating institutions to ask them a number of questions about the experience of, of conducting the survey together as a consortium. And 73% of those participating institutions said that they would consider running LibQual again in 2016. Uh, however, in 2015, Carl pulled the member libraries again, and I'm not sure, I don't know what the, uh, the, the total number was, but it was low enough that they decided to discontinue the LibQual Canada consortium. So to also give a little more context about LibQual itself, so this may be a refresher for some folks, or it may be old hat, or it may be completely new to those who, who don't know the survey very well. Um, now, originally when I created this slide, um, that radar chart at the bottom was intended as a tongue-in-cheek um, kind of joke. And those of us who are really used to LibQual, we get this joke. Um, so what it basically is, is um, this is a radar chart that would be included in uh, the reports that LibQual would send you um, when you were completed your survey. And for those of us who are basically LibQual geeks, um, I, I'm definitely in that category. I actually love this chart. I get a lot out of it. Uh, I get pretty much the, all the results in one place and I understand it. However, we found that when we would bring this back to our institutions and try to share the results with these radar charts, you could pretty much clear a room um, or, or at least look at your audience and, and they would be confused. So, so that was one thing that was a little bit not so great um, about the uh, LibQual survey. But there is a lot of good in that survey. It is a total market benchmarking survey. It is supported by the Association of Research Libraries. It is thoroughly tested. And so that was something that in my experience, I really found uh, helpful in that if you had any questions at your home institution um, about the validity of the survey tool, their ARL would have this list of resources on the LibQual webpage of all of these studies, reports, theses, et cetera, um, that people had written that basically uh, showed that the, that the survey tool itself was statistically sound. So that, was, that has been very, very helpful. It consists of 22 core questions, and those fall in the categories of affective service, information control, and library's place. And there's also a comment box and uh, demographic questions as well. There are many participants. So many institutions around the globe have participated in running the LibQual survey. And so that basically creates a very huge uh, community of practice that you could draw upon to get help, to get advice, uh, to get um, uh, some instruction as well. And speaking of instruction, ARL provided training, and I, I think they still do, um, for things like uh, deploying the LibQual survey, for analyzing the raw data, and usually that training was available or continues to be available at the uh, ARL Library Assessment Conference and I think some online uh, modules. So it's a very well supported um, and well used survey. The thing that um, we experienced some criticism about the survey was the question structure itself. So those 22 core questions were basically statements about the library 
that the respondent would be asked to provide ratings for in three different ways. So an example of one of the question statements would be, a library website enabling me to locate information on my own. And so the respondent would be required to rate that on a scale of one to nine in terms of what their desired expectation would be for, in this case, the library website. They would also have to provide a rating for their minimum expectations. So, the, so what the bare minimum of what they would expect. And then they had to give a rating for how they perceived the library to be performing when it came to, in this case, the library website. So on the back end for us, it was brilliant. We, we had all of these, all of this data and all of these scores, and we could look at the gap between desired and perceived, and we could look at the gap between minimum and perceived. So you would have this information that would tell you how much your library stands to improve when it comes to these certain things. But on the front end for the respondent, it could be a little bit confusing. So since um, the Lipwell Canada Consortium was disbanded, um, it's left some of us kind of wondering what to do, uh, at least uh, us uh, assessment folks. Um, so I do know that the, um, the Lipwell Canada listserv was still um, around in 2016 when we would have been normally gearing up to do the survey again. And I recall that there were a number of institutions that were asking, are we, are we doing this again? Um, so in the years since, uh, I know some institutions have continued to use LibQual on a regular basis. Uh, some of us have not used anything um, at all. We haven't done any surveys. And some of us have conducted surveys that we've created in-house. And then there's this, um, you know, there's this little market of uh, library surveys out there that some institutions have experimented with. So speaking of that, that's how we have come across InSync. And I'm going to let Laura uh, take it from here, and I'll be back towards the end to talk about a few more things. Okay, thanks, Linda. So hi, everyone. Uh, Carleton Library was in an interesting position. Uh, we haven't put out a big user survey in a long time. The last time we did LibQual was in 2010. So on my sabbatical, I was researching university library strategic planning, and InSync came up a couple times in Australian contexts. I thought it was interesting that I hadn't heard of it here in Canada, so decided to do some digging. And when asking our university librarian at the time, he gave me the okay to go for it. So it was scary and exciting at the same time uh, since we were the first in Canada to use it. So InSync is an Australian-based company that does library-based user surveys around the world. They essentially ask two things what is important to you, the user, and how well is the library performing? And then you find gaps in the performance and importance, and the bigger gaps are potential things to focus on in your library. So with LibQual, you look at two gaps um, between desired and perceived and minimum and perceived. InSync gives us one gap to look at, not two. Uh, there are 24 statements in InSync. Uh, LibQual has 22. And uh, the InSync statements are under four themes, communication, service and delivery, facilities and equipment, and information resources. And that's the collection and access to the collection. So this is just a quick uh, example of what the survey actually looks like. So you see the statements are divided out within the specific themes, and there's a place to put a not applicable if needed. So if there's a statement that doesn't apply to a person's situation. Okay. Statement gets a score for importance and a score for performance and the importance minus the performance equals the gap. So gaps between 1.0 and 1.99 are meaningful and should be investigated further and gaps equal to or above 2.0 are serious and should be prioritized or acted upon. So in other words, Words, statements that are high on the importance list but at the bottom of the performance list can be identified as key user concerns that the library can potentially act upon. 
Now, it can also be a good communications piece or a pat on the back for staff as well, because you can see what is in both the top 10 of importance and performance. So the stuff that's at the top of both lists means that users find these things important and the library is doing well at it. So here's just an example of some of those for Carlton. Okay, I wanted to show you uh, what InSync did for benchmarking, but you do need to take this with a grain of salt. Uh, Carlton was the first to take part. So initially we weren't going to do any of this, but as InSync was putting the report together, they asked if we wanted to try the benchmarking anyway with Australian university libraries. So that's what this is. So we're compared with over 20, 25 Australian academic libraries. So please don't ask me the math behind this uh, right now, but this is the range of average scores of all the libraries surveyed within the best practice categories, communication, service delivery, facilities and equipment, and information resources. Now our score is along the top next to November 2018. So our best score is 81.9% in information resources. That is both the collection and access to the collection. You can see we are just above the median of scores compared to the other university libraries. Now our worst and new benchmarking low is in communication, 72.8%. So we take these scores with a grain of salt. Um, we are not an Australian library, but also see it as an opportunity to find out just what Australian university libraries are doing with communication. Okay. The likelihood of recommending library to others. I wanted to point out another feature. Um, one of the standalone questions was how likely you would recommend the library to others on a zero to 10 scale. Those who marked nine to 10 are promoters, seven to eight rankings are passive, and zero to six are detractors. And then the percent of promoters minus the percent of detractors gives you a net promoter score. And I want to show you this, not as a comparison against others necessarily, but if a library decided to do this survey on a regular basis, then one could see that the score, if the score was worse or better than the previous survey and act upon that accordingly. And I thought it would be useful to tell you what you get uh, from InSync at the end of it all. So you get a key findings report. This is a PDF. It was about 27 pages for us. This is the main summary report of your top 10 and bottom 10 lists. You get a scope all respondents report. This is another PDF. Ours was 147 pages. It's very detailed. This one gets into top and bottom 10 lists and gaps by type. So for instance, what are the concerns of undergraduates or the graduates or faculty? Or what about the business students or the arts and social sciences or engineering, the faculty, the international students. It's a very uh, detailed report. And then there's comments. This is an Excel document organized by themes, best practices, types of users, things like that. There's an, anal an analysis of verbatim comments. This is 15 pages for us. It was a um, number of comments by themes, faculty. Any analysis of comments is something you pay extra for. This report is kind of a quantitative take on qualitative comments. So for example, it would say we had 20 comments on group study space, and of that, 15 of the comments were unfavorable versus favorable. So the actual comments you would find in the Excel document, this was more of a general report. And then finally, there's, a raw, there's raw data that you receive in Excel format. Okay, so this is Linda back again. Um, this, what you're seeing here, is uh, similar to the list of pros and cons that I would have taken to the senior leadership team at Dow Libraries back in late 2018. So back then what I did is um, I took a few survey tools uh, to them for them to consider. InSync was one, LibQual was another, and there were a couple more. And I had a list of pros and cons for each of those options. So I'll, I'll go through these. Um, I just want to point out that even though the cons list seems shorter than the pros list, um, some of these cons weigh very, very heavy. So first of all, in terms of the cons, um, 
not having any prior experience with this survey was something that we needed to take under consideration because we had all of this experience with LibQual. Uh, we had done LibQual uh, four times since 2005. Um, as it stands now, there still isn't a whole lot of experience um, within Canada with this survey. There's just uh, Dalhousie, Carleton, and now McMaster. But that experience is building, and, and so we are starting to, to have that within uh, the Canadian context. Um, we, had lim we have limited benchmarking, and that's the whole idea behind a total market survey is that you can benchmark. Um, so again, this is growing a little bit in that, that more and more Canadian institutions are beginning to use this survey. It's just whether or not uh, your library considers these institutions your peers. Um, we thought that we would be able to compare to Australian universities. Um, that's my, that was what my full expectation was. And I guess that's perhaps because I was so spoiled by LibQual and how LibQual worked was whatever year you conducted a survey, you had access to the results data for every institution that participated that year, regardless of to, as to the country of origin. So I was just expecting to have access to their data to do that very specific benchmarking, not the benchmarking, the general benchmarking that Laura just mentioned, the real specific ones like right down to the questions and, and how uh, those were answered. You also lose your longitudinal data. The questions are different. So you cannot do a direct comparison to uh, your results from previous uh, LibQual years. Now, having said that, um, I have been able to kind of generally reflect. So for example, um, in InSync, there is a question about the library website. And in our case, faculty aren't satisfied with the library website. I was also able to point out that back in 2013, with a similar question in LibQual about the website, faculty weren't, weren't weren't uh, satisfied with the website then. So you can do some general comparisons, you just can't do any direct um, data analysis uh, longitudinally. The qualitative analysis for comments, um, that's what you get by paying a little extra. Um, both Laura and I felt that that required improvement. Um, only from our perspective, we just felt when we looked at those reports, we wouldn't have coded the comments quite that way. We may have used different codes. Um, and so that's something that can be improved upon possibly going forward. Um, now, this last one, this is really no different from LibQual. You most likely will want to do additional uh, data analysis uh, with your raw data. Um, so for example, um, with both LibQual and InSync, you get um, the results reports for these broad groups. So I'll talk about faculty again. You may want to look at specifically how, for example, um, medicine faculty responded to questions, how arts and social sciences faculty responded to questions. And so you do have to get into the raw data and do that analysis. Um, LibQual provides that training to do that. I mentioned that earlier on, but InSync doesn't, or at least didn't um, readily offer us uh, that training. So for those of us who experienced that with LibQual, we knew what to do. Um, but that, that does definitely uh, weigh as, as a con. So as far as the pros, um, like I mentioned, you can pay uh, a fee and have that qualitative analysis of your comments done. The survey takes 10 plus minutes to complete and that's comparable with LibQual Lite. The questions do seem to be more helpful and simplified. And so by simplified, I mean the respondents only have to provide two ratings as opposed to three. And the questions seem to be a little more helpful, particularly I found in terms of space and uh, facilities and equipment. There's just more questions there uh, than what LibQual provides. The questions are not mandatory. Respondents can skip over them. InSync allowed us to edit the question wording. Now that's a pro, but it's also a little bit dicey. Um, and that's because of that whole benchmarking um, aspect. If you want to be able to benchmark with your peers, those questions have to be worded identically. Um, we were the second institution to run InSync. So 
what we did is we had to watch very carefully what Carlton had done. So Carlton beat us to it, to it, and they had edited some of the questions. And so we followed suit. There were a few instances where it just didn't quite work for us. And so we changed the wording to suit us. Um, so while we appreciated that flexibility and it was definitely needed because a lot of those questions have, um, uh, words that are Australian in nature and they, they just would not have resonated here in Canada. Um, but at the same time, going forward, there must be consistency in the wording of these questions. So if we were to use the InSync as a consortium, we would all have to agree on, on that question wording. InSync allowed additional questions and this was awesome. Um, like, like this is the thing that like the flexibility was really appreciated. We at Dal added in an additional question, and it was a demographic question where we allowed students to self-identify um, into um, underrepresented or minority groups. And that allowed us to do some additional analysis that revealed things specific about those groups. And I'm going to give you an example of that um, on the next uh, slide or two. And then finally, InSync includes a question where students can self-report their grade. And then what that allows you to do is you can then measure correlation between academic performance and library use. So there are a couple questions in there that ask students how often they use certain aspects of the library. So I have an example of that as well. Okay, so as far as that self-reported grades um, question. Now, I have a colleague at Dalhousie, um, Lachlan McLeod. He is the Copyright Services Coordinator, and he also has uh, a, a background in statistics and statistical analysis. So he did the um, significance, uh, statistical significance testing. And so you'll see that mentioned here in the parentheses. So I'm only sharing with you what we found was statistically significant. So what we found was, for our, our data at Dell, not, so not including first year undergrads, but for all the other undergrads, there was a significant positive correlation between their grades and how often they access the library online. So that was one of the insane questions, how often do you access the library online? And with that grade question, we were able to do this analysis and, and come to this statement. So I know this is correlation, it's not causation, causation is quite difficult to prove when it comes to um, academic success. However, it does uh, show that the two things go together, academic success and frequently accessing the library online. And so that is a good statement to have to vouch for continuing um, budgets to support those resources that are online. Also, if your institution is interested in learning analytics, this can act as another data point so that going forward, if uh, students are not accessing the library online, then they may be at risk for uh, their academic performance and there could be some form of intervention, um, for example, introducing them to the online library and to resources and how to do that. And that can effectually help them uh, to do better. And of course, that is a topic for a completely different um, webinar. And so the other example, uh, underrepresented student groups. So this is just two examples from our data. And again, it's just statistically significant. When it came to indigenous students, they in particular, um, feeling comfortable asking for help is important to them. So what we could do with this, with this data is we could make sure that our indigenous students are aware that they can ask for help and where and how and to make sure that they do feel comfortable in, in doing so. We also found out that our first generation students face to face help is particularly important to them. So once again, getting that message out to first generation students and well, all students actually, but, um, but to get that message out to first generation students where they can get that face to face help and to make sure that they're comfortable doing that as well. <clears throat> that can definitely help them. So that's the that's an example of having that flexibility to add um, that question into the survey. Okay, so before we get to the questions, <clears throat> um, here's an update on the Canadian Survey, survey Consortium. As far as I know, 
Uh, so late last year, uh, Carl sent out a survey about surveys um, to the Carl directors to see if they'd be interested again in a Canadian survey consortium. And from what I understand, the result was positive and they are moving forward to investigate which tool we should be using as a consortium. Also, ARL hired a consultant last year to uh, look into uh, doing a study on the lip, on LipQual. And <clears throat> from what I understand that their report uh, recommended a refresh of the, of the LipQual survey tool and that ARL is pursuing that. So I'm, I personally am really interested in seeing what comes of this refresh. Uh, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to, to, uh, to bring back the LipQual survey in a uh, different way. And so just in conclusion, um, <clears throat> the value that we have in being a, a consortium and doing this together and running a survey together, regardless as to the tool that we choose, is that we have that opportunity to benchmark, to compare with each other, to do longitudinal comparisons, and then to share our results and experiences and to build up that community of practice again in Canada when it comes to these total market library surveys. And so, sorry, I apologize. I'm having problems with my mouse here. <laughs> and that leads us to the end. And uh, Laura and I are open for questions. All right, well, thank you, Laura and Linda. Um, this is just a reminder that participants can post questions using the chat or Q&A features. Um, I'm seeing two so far. Uh, so the first one is, and I guess this is for both of you, uh, would you use NSYNC again for your next library survey? Uh, this is Laura. Um, yes, Carlton would. Uh, so when we look at criteria for what we want, um, we wanted something that was easy to administer, easy for our users to understand, and easy for us to read a summary and interpret the details of where our priorities should focus. And so for that, InSync met our criteria. Uh, anything else was bonus for us. That might happen with LibQual too, but for our needs, InSync was a good fit. And uh, I'll answer from my perspective, uh, Dal, and uh, now that we're getting into um, wrapping up the nitty gritty of all the raw data analysis with InSync, um, I would definitely be open to uh, conducting InSync again. But knowing that ARL is going to um, review uh, LibQual and it maybe um, come back to us in a different uh, format, I'm, I'm definitely game for uh, trying that again. Uh, it all depends on what they come up with. I think it's probably a really great opportunity um, to, to refresh the LibQual tool. So I'm, I'm kind of a open book, uh, open slate, like I, we'll see what, what the survey market uh, is looking like at that time. Okay, our next question is, do you know if InSync is available in French? That is a great question, and I do not know. <laughs> Linda, do you happen to know? I, I don't know, but just knowing how um, eager they seem to be to please um i'm sure that, yeah i'm sure that wouldn't be a problem for for them uh to to work with translators to to have it translated okay next question were the patron types a standard set of australian greens or were they customized for your schools um they were, this is Laura at Carleton. I believe, I'm thinking back to uh, 2018 when we did this, we set out, we, we customized it for our school. So we said, um, we had the Faculty of Arts and Social Science, Business, uh, Engineering, we, we set those out ourselves. Yes, same here at Dalhousie. Um, next one, has anyone tried the Ithaca student survey? Carleton has not, um, and Carleton did not take part in the, I think it was 2015 or something, or 2014 uh, Ithaca faculty survey. Carleton didn't take part in that either, so uh, I don't have any comment on the Ithaca student survey. 
Uh, at Dalhousie, we have, that was one of the options I did take to the table, um, but I, I wasn't really recommending it. It is quite a lengthy survey. Um, it covers a lot of topics. Um, I definitely support the survey itself, but from the library's perspective, it, it almost seemed like it would be a survey that uh, student affairs would uh, conduct. Um, and yes, and just knowing that it's strictly, I think there's actually two, there's two student surveys and then you have your fa faculty survey. So there's actually three Ithaca surveys that you would have to do in order to get uh, your, your, your whole community. So it just, it wasn't really a viable option for us. Okay, um, did students make any negative comments about the InSync survey? Uh, so this is Linda Dell. Um, I did not see any negative comments about the survey itself and nobody uh, got in touch to make any negative comments about it. There, there actually were positive comments that I came across in the comments file about the survey. It was more along the lines that they were just happy that they were being asked these questions, yeah. that they were given an opportunity. Um, unfortunately, in years past with LibQual, there weren't many, but there was always at least a few <laughs> negative comments that came in um, about the structure of the questions. And at Carleton as well, um, there weren't any negative comments from the students. There were a couple, um, there were a couple comments from the faculty that they felt that it was a bit more geared to the students, but that was certainly amongst the minority. Uh, most people, um, faculty included, had positive comments. And from a, I did not uh, conduct the the Paul survey back in 2010, but I saw those comments and there were a few more negative uh, from both faculty and students in there. Okay, we have a few more. Um, when looking at the quantitative data provided in the standardized report, did you find the NSYNC model's importance performance measure versus the minimum perceived desire level easier to interpret? Okay, this, this is Linda again at, at Dell. Um, yes, <laughs> um, I did find it easy uh, to interpret, but you're in a way, I'm the, almost the wrong person to answer this because I did a lot of work with LibQual and it became very easy over time to have your mind in kind of two different places. The, that, that um, I think it was called an adequacy mean. Um, that would be the gap between minimum and perceived. Um, we didn't often look at the other um, gap, which was your desired and perceived, because we were just more focused on um, trying to meet minimum um, expectations in certain areas. Um, so yeah, so I, I think for anyone who has not conducted um, LibQual, I think they would find um, InSync easier than LibQual. Um, those who have a lot of experience with LibQual, we have gotten used to it uh, over the years. I, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, um, and this is Laura here at Carleton. I just have the um, thing in front of me and they're, they're very clear lists of here are the top 10 in performance and here are the top 10 in importance and here's where things fit in both. And I know in the more detailed analysis, it's all color coded um, where you see the gaps and where you see the things that are important and, and, um, and high performance and things like that. So I, I found it fairly okay to read. Um, Would you like me to continue reading them out or? Yes, because I'm, I'm not sure where we are right now. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking so, at them. <laughs> last time we did the LibQual in 2017, we had a lot of strong worded and sometimes snarky comments from users about how data, how dated the survey looked. Um, how about InSync? Is it compatible with mobile, tablets, etc.? This is Linda. It, it is definitely compatible with all devices. Um, I, I looked at it in all the instances and um, I, I found it, um, it didn't look dated. Um, it looked, it's quite streamlined. It's quite, it's, um, 
very tasteful, <laughs> actually, uh, very simple on the screen. Um, I can't re remember exactly what LibQual looked like on the screen, but I would guess that NSYNC it looks, looks a, is a bit easier on the eyes. Okay, um, if I understand correctly, benchmarking analysis is provided at the category level, not individual question. Is it possible to benchmark at the question level using raw data, i.e. is the raw data truly raw? Okay, so this is Linda, I'll take that question. Um, I didn't, I mentioned this um, on one of the slides that the benchmarking was not as robust as I was expecting it to be. It was not like LibQual. Um, where we could go in and easily get access to everybody, all the institutions who had participated um, that year and look at their data and actually do that question by question um, benchmarking. Uh, it, it was not possible. Now, I think that um, perhaps that can still be negotiated between Carl and I think it's Carl um, in Australia. Uh, we just haven't gotten to to that point. Um, I'm confident that it could be, but otherwise, there, there, there's no easy way of doing that. And so, even within Canada, if if I wanted to compare directly with uh, Carlton, I would have to communicate uh, directly with Laura, and we would have to agree to share our raw data to do that. Okay, how would you compare the effort it takes to run an instance of LibQual versus InSync? Is InSync just as much work, considering all the different aspects, ethics, communication, analysis, et cetera? Uh, this is Linda. Um, I, it was as much work. It was the same. I'm, I'm trying to think if there was really any, any difference. To, to me, it was the same. Um, because it's it's a survey, you have to market it, you have to set it up. You you know you you at your own institution may have to get ethics approval. Um, all the communication, it's it's really the same. And then in the end, um, the analysis was pretty much the same too. I I was that was one thing that I was a little bit disappointed in. I just thought that um, we were going to get more in the reports than we did. So I think a lot of you know that when you run these big surveys, very, very seldom will you get a respondent group that is representative of your whole community. Um, and so if you don't have a representative sample in your respondent group, then those broad statements in the initial report aren't really meaningful. Um, and so, in order to do to get into you have to drill down and you do have to do that raw data analysis yourself. So to me, it, it, having run the whole course, it was the same amount of work as LibQual. So this is uh, Laura. Um, so at Carlton, I do remember the timeline, we sort of signed the contract in um, uh, end of June, beginning of July. And the survey was out for three weeks in November. So however many months <laughs> that is in between. Um, and we had a small group of about four or five people who looked at the questions and looked at uh, the different things that needed to be looked at. Um, so it was, it was, it was pretty good for um, uh, conducting the survey. And yes, there was um, more analysis at the and for comments specifically for me, I dealt a lot more with the comments side. I felt like that needed to be worked on a bit more, but um, from the start to finish was uh, whatever, however many months that is, the uh, end of June to the beginning of November for actually putting it out. And I thought maybe I would, just, I can't remember if this was asked in this particular question because the questions are kind of coming out a lot, but Linda and I had different uh, experiences with what we were allowed to do uh, because Carleton, um, our Office of Institutional Research and Planning, OIRP, only allowed us to do a sample of the um, users. So we were allowed, of the close to 30,000 that Carleton has, we were allowed to do uh, 5,000 students and half the faculty and staff. 
Um, and so our, our getting ready was um, possibly slightly different than Dalhousie's because we were looking at our communications and things were more, it was a direct email. Um, whereas Dalhousie was able to uh, survey everybody. So the behind the scenes were slightly different between the two universities. Um, so I thought I would add that in there. We had to get survey approval, but we did not have to get ethics approval. I did check with that, but we didn't have to at Carleton. I'm not sure where we are in these questions. <laughs> okay, I have only one left. It's a three-parter though. Um, oh. Did you have higher response and completion rates with InSync rather than LibQual? So do you want me to go first, Linda? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So now LibQual, we didn't do since 2010, but uh, I did take a look at the time uh, in 2010, Carleton was still allowed to, the library was still allowed to survey everybody. So there were about 27,000 students at the time. And uh, Carleton is very well known for um, people not responding to surveys. So um, we only had 550 people answer the LibQual survey, LibQual Lite, in 2010. So fast forward to 2018, we had 5,000 plus the faculty and staff, and um, we had 1,080. So we did get a better response. It's, it's kind of comparing apples and oranges, but, but we did definitely have a good response compared to past surveys. And for us at Dow, um, it is a bit of apples to oranges because we were able to um, deploy the survey a little bit differently. Yeah. Uh, so what I mean specifically is that um, uh, the libraries look after the, le the uh, learning management system. We look after Brightspace. And so it was easy for us to put a survey invitation uh, right into Brightspace. So it could be because of that, or it could be partly because of a different survey, but our numbers almost doubled um, from 2013 to 2019. So we had a uh, little over 3,600 in 2013 with LibQual, and we had almost uh, 6,700 in 2019. Second part to the question is, what are some examples of questions that you are deeply interested in benchmarking across institutions? Or maybe doing what I'm doing right now, and that Ooh, is looking at the I'm questions. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I, I don't have the questions in front. I don't have the statements in front of me. So for us, the so for Carlton, we were okay with the general um, um, themes, as opposed to looking into the different questions. I wish I had the questions in front of me, and I don't. But um, but for Carl for Carlton's sake we were more interested in the the general uh themes so i would leave it at that for carlton i'm i'm interested in the communications questions because uh laura mentioned um that uh in that general benchmarking that instinct did uh for carlton that um communication um was uh, a new benchmark low. We did not do well either in comparison to the Australian <laughs> institutions. So um, between Laura and I, we're like, maybe they're, they just have different expectations with regards to communications in Australia or, or maybe, yeah, it's interesting. maybe they've worked some magic there that, that we don't know. Um, so I'm curious about those, that, like I would like to compare that across um, a Canadian peers just to see if, if we're, if you know, all of us are you know, compared to each other, we're doing just fine. Uh, I'm always, I am curious about the library website uh, question, um, particularly with faculty. And it was something that I was really interested in back in the LibQual days um, because um, no one seemed to do well uh, on, on the website question. And uh, except for the institutions in Quebec, they, they seem to have a secret there with their websites, uh, I'm, at least back in 2013. Um, it's, oh gosh, there's so many questions here. I'm just looking through them. Um, it's hard to pick out um, anything individual. Um, 
that we would want to find out. Every everything is everything is good here. There's a question about the search box being easy to use. There's a lot of um, space questions as well, and, and we're not used to that because there were five uh, library is place questions in LibQual that were very kind of general, and yet InSync has these very specific uh, questions. For example, a computer is available when I need one. Uh, laptop facilities, example, desks and power uh, meet my needs. There's a question about the wireless. Uh, there's a question about the printing and scanning facilities. So ha having these new, very specific questions about uh, space and facilities is, is uh, of interest uh, for sure. And last one, where were the survey costs comparable between InSync and LibQual? <laughs> Do you have an answer, Linda? I'm not sure because we haven't done LibQual in a while. Um, I so again, like I, I, it's it's um, hard for me to remember exact uh, pricing. So what I can remember, what I will share with you, is how I felt about uh, the pricing at the time that it was under consideration. So I remember seeing the price and seeing um, the list of what you would get in terms of the reports. And I remember thinking at the time that it would be comparable to LibQual, but I was factoring in labor time for data analysis that in the end I ended up having to do anyway. <laughs> so um, in that respect, it seemed to be a little more expensive. So. Um, it would, I would have to like kind of go back and reconsider and, and, and compare to, to see, but um, that much I, I do remember is that I was expecting to not have to do some work that I ended up doing and that was part of the consideration in the price. So I have uh, two more questions here that have popped up. Uh, Linda, could you talk about data cleaning coding if you didn't already? <laughs> Lachlan works with me. Um, I, I, I'm assuming this is this is uh, Lachlan from Dell. Um, we there was some extra um, cleaning that we again didn't anticipate having to do. Um, again, these are things that can be worked out with InSync, I think, as a consortium, if we were to do it as a consortium, um, so that the data we get is more ready to, to go. Um, if Lachlan wants to say something about that, um, possibly we can unmute him. I don't know if he's willing. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that name. Who was that? Uh, Lachlan. Oh, Lachlan. If you're, I, I don't know if I've, I don't know if I'm putting him on the spot though. Um, I sent him a notice that he's allowed to talk. If he accepts it, he'll be able to unmute himself. Hey. Oh, there he is. Um, yeah. So we basically some of the questions, like um, some of the questions, the multiple selection questions, not just our own, but the ones that were provided by um, InSync. Uh, we're coded as what we call a string variable. So you have like a comma separated thing that's like one, three, four, five for every selection that someone selected. Uh, and to do some frequencies and other analysis, we had to pull that apart. Um, there's also issues with labeling. So a lot of the variables weren't labeled. Um, and then questions from uh, sort of similar questions were uh, coded differently. Um, so like a scale question might start with never sometimes or end with never other times. Um, so in those cases, we always went back to InSync and asked if they could uh, clean it or provide us with a cleaner version. And they said they could at a cost uh, essentially because the survey is automated and kind of spitting this stuff out. So then by hand, they'd have to do it after. So the survey isn't designed to kind of provide the data and ideally for analysis, how you'd want to see it. And when we went back to them and they weren't really willing to help unless uh, we paid. And then there was a few other things like the code book was a PDF that couldn't be copy pasted. So we had to 
ask for a spreadsheet code book. So then when I was doing the labeling myself, I could just reduce some of the labor. So there's a lot of the, the data had to be cleaned significantly. And then some of the data as well, we had people uh, accidentally responding to uh, certain questions, especially around grades, because the survey piping didn't put uh, certain people into the correct category. So we had to kind of distinguish that like, uh, this person was an undergraduate uh, who had answered the wrong kind of grade question, for instance. Um, so that was all sort of stuff that we had to deal with and it added to the analysis time by quite a bit. Yeah, Carlton didn't include that grade analysis. Um, I know it was a newer question for InSync. Um, so we, we didn't include that in there. So we're almost out of time, but I do have one last question here. Uh, I know there is a section on service delivery. How is that category defined? Does that include depth of expertise, partnerships, collaborations, or is it more geared to service points in quotation marks? So Mark, I, I saw your question. I've been trying to look. Um, this is Laura at Carleton and I can't find it amongst my papers right now, but um, I vaguely recall it was closer to kind of service delivery, um, the, the more traditional service <laughs> delivery things. Um, but that is one that um, we would have to investigate further. I don't have um, the interesting thing about pandemics is we don't have all of our stuff in front of us <laughs> that yes. we thought we would when we were going to do this. Only so when we left our offices a month ago. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I do oh, have I don't list. remember. I have it in front of me. Um, yeah, so if you can just bear with me for a second here, I can kind of give you a sense of what those questions are. There's uh, 10. Um, there's one about, uh, they put, uh, there's, there's one and only one information literacy question, and it falls under the service uh, delivery section. So that's a question about workshops. Oh, and actually, yeah, it's not worded that great. <laughs> Uh, library workshops, classes, and tutorials online or in person help me with my learning and research needs. Um, they've, they've blended a lot of things into one question, unfortunately, with that one. Um, they, we could have stood to, you know, splice this out in maybe three different questions. Um, <clears throat> however, that, that is the standard in-sync question. Um, library anticipating learning and research needs. Opening hours, there's a question about opening hours. Uh, books and articles um, are delivered promptly. Online help services meet my needs. Face-to-face -face help meet my needs. Uh, items are on the shelves. Staff provide accurate answers. Uh, I feel comfortable asking for help. And I can't remember if we added this question. Simple access to key library resources through, in our case, Brightspace uh, meets my learning needs. I, I can't remember what that question originally was, <clears throat> but I just know that not many institutions have the LMS as part of their um, responsibilities. So I, I can't remember if that was a standard question or not. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any more questions. So on behalf of Carl, I'd like to thank our speakers for their excellent presentation and all of our participants for attending. Uh, the recording should be available shortly, and we ask that you keep an eye out for other upcoming webinars and community calls in our series. Uh, au nom de la BRC, je tiens à vous remercier, à remercier notre présentatrice pour cette excellente présentation, ainsi que tous nos participants pour leur présence. L'enregistrement devrait être disponible sous peu, et d'autres webinars et appels communautaires à venir peuvent être consultés sur le site web de la BRC. Have a great week all. Passez une bonne semaine.